Welcome to episode number 130 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today we have Max Co. Max is a speaker and trainer by his profession. He's trained over 10,000 people on marketing and digital advertising in the last 10 years. He's also an investor in stocks and businesses. And even uh, at the age of 29, Max was able to create over a million dollars in assets from investing in good companies. Um, and just for fun, as a bit of a side hustle, Max recently, uh, six months ago, started teaching um, an online course and membership. And he's actually scaled that side hustle business from zero to $100,000 uh, in less than six months using pure organic traffic and zero ads. So I know we've got so much we're going to learn from Max today. So Max, welcome to the uh, the podcast. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Now, we are really appreciative, Max. I know you've get, gotten up uh, super early there in Singapore, where you live. <laughs> now, we go back, we were just trying to work out, uh, we think somewhere between three, four, probably closer to five years. Uh, we got to meet an event uh, in Singapore. I think in Singapore, maybe even in, in Hong Kong as well. We, we have done an event there. And I know yeah. you had a lot of uh, background in speaking and training. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey and your background. What is it that you do? Yeah, so I think... To kind of uh, compress it, because I, I I can I can go all day with this, right? So to kind of compress it in like a five minutes to be mindful of time and the listeners as well. I think uh, my journey started when I was about a 15, 16 year old boy in school in Singapore. So uh, which is high school in Singapore. In in locally we call it secondary school. So uh, back then I had terrible grades. I was extremely rebellious. I kind of hated studying and all that kind of stuff. And my life changed when I watched this um, documentary on the television happen to come home from school one day. I was addicted to computer games. I just couldn't focus. And I came across this documentary showing uh, motivational speakers. So the documentary was on the life of motivational speakers. And I came across two motivational speakers that really just, I would say, lit a fire under my ass. Uh, the first guy was, of course, Tony Robbins. Right? And the second guy was more like a locally well-known speaker in Singapore. His name, his name is called Adam Koo, uh, which is kind of like the Asian version of Tony Robbins. He's one of the more early pioneers of motivational speaking, peak performance coaching uh, locally in our scene in Singapore. And I came across just the documentary documenting their lives and everything. And as an impressionable, innocent, young 15, 16 year old boy, it struck the idea to me like, oh my goodness, wow, you can actually speak on stage, make people laugh, tell them your story, and earn big bucks. So of course, now looking back, I know it's not so straightforward. There's a lot of backend stuff you got to do, but there was the young, impressionable Max back then. And I was like, okay, I want to be like that. So that was how it really just planted the seed that I want to be a motivational speaker. Uh, or kind of like you know, the cheesy term is a motivational speaker, even though today I realized that you have to have um, some sort of niche that you talk about and then the motivational stuff comes in as a side element because um, unless you're like a well-known I would say um, guru out there like Tony Robbins, then you can just talk about generic stuff, right? So uh, at least for me, that was the dream. And I went around telling all my friends that, hey, you know what? When I grow up, I want to be a peak performance coach and a motivational speaker. <laughs> and everyone looked at me because, you know, 15, 16, nobody has this idea or connotation of what a <laughs> motivational speaker means. And they looked at me like, Max, can you elaborate on that? What does that mean? So, but yeah, that was how <laughs> the, the seed for speaking was first planted. And then kind of to fast forward the whole thing uh, at about, I would say when I was in my early 20s, I came across uh, one of my first few mentors in life uh, who are my current bosses as well. And I love them to the moon and back. It's uh, Calvin and Patricia. I believe you have met them. So they actually run this company known as uh, Wealth Mastery over here in Singapore. And we connected over like coffee, got to know them through like a forum where it was a digital marketing forum so we kind of connected through the forum met in real life for coffee and then uh, they kind of started mentoring me took them under their wing and I started working for them when I came out of university in Singapore and then the rest is history because uh, they gave me the platform to speak on stage because even though it's a digital marketing company uh, we do have our own digital marketing e-commerce businesses we help other clients do the same as well but we have a education arm and I've always told them that hey since young my dream, while I think digital marketing is interesting, I love it, uh, it's still to speak, to teach, and just to inspire others from stage. And so they gave me that platform. And then I would say I just soaked it all in. Like, like to me, the work is like play, right? So I just put in all my hours learning how to speak. And in my free time, 
I mean, you probably can tell I look quite nerdy here and I really am. I, um, I would spend all my free time just watching videos of like Tony Robbins, Barack Obama, um, like I would say I'm watching a lot of stand-up comedy, the Asian ones and the <laughs> Western ones, uh, attending a lot of uh, wedding dinners to see how the host and the MC speak. And just kind of finding my own niche and my own style that's evolved as a mixture of all these things. I was just madly in love and passionate about making people laugh, making people cry from stage. And I just have this love when like you know, people ask me like, why do you love speaking so much? And I guess there was once I just replied that, hey, you know, I just love the idea of someone coming up to you after like a three-day course or like a one-day keynote or whatever and say, hey, Max, that one line and that one sentence that you said, that really gave me like a, like a eureka moment, an aha moment, like a paradigm shift. And to me, yeah, that, that's worth more than what money can ever buy. That feeling where you know you made a small little difference or you planted a seed in someone's trajectory or, or change of the view of the world, uh, that means a lot. So that was kind of... Uh, my whole speaking journey in five minutes <laughs> yeah well and uh what a journey it's been and you're very modest you, you haven't uh shared there but you've you shared the stage with some pretty big names haven't you yeah so i would say i was very fortunate to kind of, kind of share the same stage with uh, certain thought leaders i think the more prominent one being a uh, virgin galactic uh, or virgin group right <laughs> richard branson yeah well, there you go and so it's pretty amazing that you have this vision of this idea as a 15 or 16 year old uh, kid and then within less than a decade you're there and you're doing it with some of the leaders of the industry that's pretty inspiring um have you any any key lessons that you've learned along the way is there anything you want to share with anyone else who has a vision or a goal that they want to accomplish and you know it maybe seems like it's a long way away from them right now what, what would you want to share with them yeah i, I think for me thanks for asking that because you're kind of uh this is like therapy or you're taking me back on the <laughs> memory lane, which I love. Uh, a great interview normally is like therapy. So thanks for that. Uh, yeah. I would say two things that I felt looking back and reflecting had a very big impact on uh, my trajectory. So I think number one was this video that I watched when I was only 22, 23 years old, which I, I'm 32 this year in full disclosure. So I'm still kind of young, but uh, that was about 11 years back. And uh, I was still in university back then. Of course, back then I was still like a struggling amateur speaker, don't really have a platform yet because I've only just met my bosses and uh, my mentors, Kevin and Patricia. So I uh, didn't really have much of a platform, but I came across this documentary movie. Uh, I'm not sure you've watched it before. It's called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Have you watched it before? I've never heard of it. Okay, I'll do like the one minute uh, synopsis for you. So the essence of the video that really played such a big impact on me, and I've watched it like another four or five more times since then, it featured the life of this Japanese sushi master. His name is called Jiro, J-I-R-O. And he's kind of like a three-star Michelin uh, sushi chef over in Tokyo, in Japan. And he's so well-known in his sushi that people, Barack Obama, like um, well-known celebrities from all over the world, um, Jay Cho, which is the Taiwanese mental pop star, basically like Shinzo Abe, which is the previous Japanese president, uh, prime minister, uh, flew in just, just to eat his sushi, right? And the essence of the movie sh featured his upbringing and his, his, how he, he holds his skills of a sushi master. Here's the part that did it for me. And in the video, he was at, it was like a documentary, right? So they interviewed him. And he said that even in his dreams, this guy is like an 80 plus year old man back when I was watching it. So I believe today is probably in his 90s already. But even at 80 years old, when they interviewed him, he mentioned that even in his dreams and he was sleeping, he dreams about making sushi better. And of course, I mean, I think we all know the Japanese spirit, they have kind of like that Kaizen, that samurai spirit to always want to do things better, that, that craftsman mentality, right? That really hit me real hard because I'm like, wow, this is a guy in his 80s who is a three-star Michelin chef who is probably the number one sushi master well-known in the world. And you can't even do a booking at his restaurant. You have to do it through a hotel. That in the, so it's, it's extremely exclusive. And he dreams of still making sushi better at 80 years old. And you guys know, in, you know, like the Japanese and stuff, like the, the apprentices in his restaurant, because they have this apprenticeship system in Japan, they have to stay in the restaurant and work there for at least 10 years or more before they're allowed to make the tamago sushi. So the tamago sushi is the egg, you know, the egg sushi, before they're even allowed to learn how to bake the sushi, uh, the egg. And they actually interviewed one of his apprentices where this guy is like 15 years in already. So he said like, on my 10th year, 
when Jiro finally came up to me and said, hey, you know what? You're ready to make the egg. I just broke down and cried. I'm, I'm, I'm narrating it from his point of view. And I was like, wow, that's, that's so beautiful. It's just the, I think the essence I took away was just one thing, craftsmanship. The ability to just fall in love with the, the boredom of the day in, day out, plain vanilla repetitions, the process, which is what we call it, and just kind of uh, screw the outcome <laughs> and just focus on the process. That really hit me hard. So that was the same lens that I took it uh, onto my speaking, which is why if you recall early on, I mentioned about me falling in love with speaking, watching a ton of speakers and then having the platform to go out there and hone and polish my skills as a speaker, as a trainer, and then going back to the to the kitchen, what we call, and then trying to learn from more speakers and then trying to like tune the recipe or my speaking styles, my body language whatsoever. Uh, that was really the same essence that really shaped my life as a speaker. So I always, always, till today have the same craftsman mentality to everything that I approach. Like whatever I do, can I, the question I would ask myself, okay, <laughs> we are here. The question I would ask myself, can I do to onto another level um, from last week, from the month before, without uh, with no regards for the outcome so what can i do to keep getting better at this skill that i have yeah yeah i think there was a slight lag there pardon me i'm not sure whether it's <laughs> it's me or it's you but yeah so uh, if i need to repeat myself i think it's uh, kind of uh, what what's this what what's the skill that i want to improve and what can i do on a day-to-day -day basis that allows me to kind of still hone this process to be better than where i was last week and last month uh, but for me, it's all about trying to enjoy the process. So uh, that's the question that I ask myself, which is how can I enjoy the process and develop skills more than last month or last week? Uh, what have you? Yep. So I guess that's the number one thing that had a big impact. And I guess yeah, the second thing was just having mentors that give me the platform. So I think the right mentors are very crucial, which I'm sure you're a believer of. I'm sure you're mentoring people as well, Kevin. And so um, to me, it's just uh, without mentors, I think to me, it's just a shortcut, right? I think a lot of times in life, um, one belief that I've shaped over the years, in, when I was younger, you know, in, in life, especially in the self-help, personal development world, we always love to ask this question, which is, how can I achieve whatever the goal is? How can I achieve X, Y, Z? But then over the years, I've realized that rather than asking how, I should be asking the question, who do I know <laughs> that can help me reach A, B, C, or X, Y, Z a lot faster? Because, and so that question will lead you to the proper mentors or coaches, what have you. Because then I realized in life, the question of when you ask how, you're always going to be thinking of how can you go learn it from books, from courses and do it the longer way. Whereas when you ask who, it kind of shortcuts the process because you're finding people who have done it before already. So uh, those are the two main things. Number one, craftsmanship. And number two, asking the question who has done it before. And then finding these people to become your mentors or to kind of coach and learn from them. Sometimes you've got to pay more. Actually, most times you've got to pay for it, but it's worth the money and stuff. And so, yeah, for me, that made a big difference in uh, my trajectory as a speaker, as a trainer. Yeah. I love it. Some very valuable things there. And I don't know about anyone else, but I'm feeling pretty hungry for some sushi right now. <laughs> I, could, I could definitely eat that. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to play the, the really important point there. You said yeah. to fall in love with the process. And it's something that yeah. we can forget. People are so in such a hurry to get to the outcome, they're not actually falling in love with the process. But you said, if you love the process, you're dreaming about improving that sushi every single day, well, that sushi as an outcome is going to get better. And Max, I, I recognize this. I can clearly see evidence of that in your presenting and speaking. I can see evidence of that, of course. Uh, I know you, you often share videos uh, on your social media of your, your workout regimes. I can see you have that same discipline there as well. And yeah. it sounds like you had that same discipline in terms of, your finance and wealth creation. Tell us a little bit about that, because I know that's not uh, maybe the main focus. Your career is in serving other people and, and helping them yeah. improve. You've actually had this good focus uh, in terms of wealth and wealth creation. We'd love to hear a little more about, around that. Yeah, sure. So I, I think the, so actually, well, you're actually very, very sharp. So yeah, I kind of, I think you can tell, I apply my life based on the craftsmanship mentality right after that movie impacted me. So everything I do, I try and break it up into habits, into what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis to move forward. And then right after, I would say around after quite a few years of working in, with uh, the company I'm with, which is Wealth Mastery, which is with Kelvin and Patricia, my mentors, and kind of 
being a speaker and trainer for a few years, obviously, I think, you know, as a speaker, the amazing thing is that you have scale. So when you speak one to many, of course, uh, the, inco the income can be great as well. Right? And so um, I started to see my savings because uh, I'm quite a frugal saver, right? So I started to see my savings actually increase in, in the bank. But we all know looking at the money in the bank increasing, I kind of started to feel a, bit, a little bit annoyed. I mean, once it crossed like six figures and all that, I'm like, okay, there has to be a better use than putting the money in the bank because I think we all know uh, interest rates are not the most exciting. Maybe right now as we're speaking in July 2022, <laughs> interest rates are rising. So maybe, but that was like five, six years back, right? So interest rates were pathetic. And even now at this interest rate, it's still not going to really kind of help you beat inflation, whatever. So I just kind of got really annoyed. Like, okay, there has to be a better use for the money. And then I, I think a turning point came was when I came across this guy, I believe everyone that's listening to this is going to expect me to say like, oh, Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad, but no, not really. <laughs> okay, so uh, Robert Kiyosaki, I did read about him. I think fantastic book. But the turning point for me came was when I came across this guy who's super big on Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure how many people actually know of him. He's, he's very big in the VC space, the venture capitalist space. His name is called Naval Ravikant, right? So have you heard of Naval? Have yeah, not. Okay, so yeah, so Naval Rabbitan is a, he's an angel investor. I just spell his name out, uh, N A V A L, and then the surname because it's of of, of uh, Indian origins is uh, R A V I Ravi Kant K A N T. So he's very big on Twitter. He's a well known multi 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 millionaire or maybe even a billionaire. I'm not sure the exact net worth because I <laughs> think there's no point counting at that level. Uh, he's a well known venture capitalist and angel investor, and he said this thing. Uh, so he wrote like a tweet storm, which is a, a series of threats uh, or series of tweets on Twitter as a threat. And it's the, the title of the threat, if you guys have time or if you have time, you can Google, it's called How to Get Wealthy or How to Get Rich. That's the title, but it's a well-known uh, article that it was made into an article. And the essence of the article was just talking about wealth. And I recall this statement that put this part in that is like, no matter how much or how hard you work, which we all know, you will never get rich renting out your time. The only way to become wealthy uh, in the capitalistic world, which we all live in, <laughs> right, is to actually own a slice of an asset, which is equity. And of course, so that really hit me hard. And in a sense where, so wealth is not money in the bank because money in the bank is just savings, right? Wealth is the robots working for you when you're asleep. The house that's bringing rental when you're asleep. The businesses generating cash flow for you when you're asleep. Kind of, so I'm kind of paraphrasing, but the essence of the article was talking about wealth is assets that earn cash for you while you sleep, which we kind of all know from like rich dad, poor dad. But that really hit it very hard home for me in the sense where you're not trying to get rich because you want to be able to buy fur coats or Gucci bags or Ferrari cars, whatever. You're trying to get wealthy because you want to have the ability to say no, the ability to control your time and be your own free sovereign individual. And for some reason, that really hit me so hard. So I started asking myself, okay, Max, I can do all these seminars and speaking classes all I want. And yes, it's good income. But income is just what we exchange for our time, right? So in, in exchange for providing value, it's kind of like an IOU uh, that, you know, society says, hey, you give me value, I'll give you this piece of paper with a Benjamin Franklin on it back, <laughs> which is uh, money, right? And then what happens is, but I think to myself, I don't have any assets. So I started asking myself, do I want to start a business? And when I look deep down, I don't think... I'm, I have like the entrepreneurial butt and drive within me. So I was very self-aware of this since you know, I, I, I have zero interest in starting a business and building something from scratch. A side hustle maybe, but not like a full-fledged business business per se, right? which is why I have so much respect for business owners because it's just not something within me. So the part about building a business is out. And then I ask myself, so I'm doing my elimination. Can I buy a property? Uh, I think I can, but I'm not that excited by property. I'm so fascinated with people who are like real estate moguls and all that. But I just have zero interest going around doing properties. I have a lot of friends who tell me that when they look at a property and they refurbish it, they feel that sense of accomplishment. Like, oh my goodness, this is my creation. But I get super bored. And then I ask myself, <laughs> where, does my, where does my interest lie? My interest lies in the me being a big nerd. I just love analyzing businesses, looking at the competitive advantages, understanding the history of example, like um, just a very cliche example, how Amazon built up its network effects, how it built up its 
competitive advantage by having a ton of fulfillment centers around the US to have like one day shipping, whatever, via Amazon Prime. How Netflix was able to build up its advantage by having a ton of users so it can spread the cost of producing its movies across a large user base. Nerdy stuff like that. So uh, reading balance report, uh, balance sheets, uh, annual income statements, you know, earnings reports, uh, cash flow statements, what have you, all the mathematical and uh, qualitative uh, stuff of the business. And I'm like, okay, cool. If that's the case, then let me go down the investing path because I'm still going to own businesses, just that I own it as a part owner, not as the main owner. And so that just, I went just all out nerdy, bazooka into um, learning how to actually invest. And I applied the same craftsman mentality. Every single day, the, the goal was to read one annual report. At least I try to. So similarly to how I try and work out every day, I try and watch an episode of a stand-up comedy every day in my early days to try and get better at speaking and making people laugh, whatever, from stage. I applied the same craftsman mentality every day or every week, try and read an annual report or try and read about a new business model. And then that was how... I started the whole journey of investing and then I started investing my money in trenches and then of course I think with a lot of blessings a lot of fortune and I think a lot of hard work as well all the time on the plane in the hotel room because this was before COVID right so you're always flying doing seminars different parts of the world uh, in the hotel room and the plane at the airport was all just spent reading investing books and then very fortunately I was able to cross my first million at the age of 29. Uh, but I would say a lot of thanks was due to the capital base I built in my early years from the speaking gig and then investing like the cherry on the ice saying that took it to a whole new level. Uh, yeah, so I hope this answers the question in terms of how I, how and why I started investing. Yeah. Yes, answers it very well. A lot, of, a lot of great value in there. And of course, congratulations on achieving the million dollar mark uh, prior thanks. to age 30. I think it's something a lot of people uh, would very much aspire to to accomplish. And not everyone, uh, I, I feel a little bit excited being an accountant about reading the financial statements and doing those kind of things, but not everyone on the call will probably share the same enthusiasm <laughs> yeah. that we do around that. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to pick up on something because you really, it sounds like you're seeking out the businesses that are maybe publicly traded, they're under value, and then of course you make an investment and then you, presumably you're holding them for the long term rather than trading yes. in and out of a business. Yes. That's right. Correct. So I think to kind of share the process, because this is not an investing interview, but I'll just kind of compress the thing yes. uh, so I don't lose the listeners. Uh, yeah, so it's mainly businesses. So I look at it. So even, yeah, it's actually uh, public stocks, uh, public market equity. The reason you keep seeing me use the word business is because I want to train my mind because, you know, in, in speaking, we learn about, a lot about psychology. So I don't want to keep using, I don't like to use the word stocks because it makes me feel like I can just trade it in and out, which I can because it's liquid, but I want to kind of uh, brainwash myself to keep using the word business. I'm a business owner so that I look at it very long term because that's where the biggest wealth are made. So yes, uh, I buy businesses that are growing, uh, that have a long runway and that have um, an intrinsic value, which is a investing nerdy technical term, intrinsic value that's less than the market price. And once I'm in, uh, I do monitor them. I do like the maintenance due diligence over the years, over the quarters. And then I hold them uh, to kind of reap the rewards of compounding as the business grows so does my wealth and equity uh, compound and grow along with it. So yeah, that's the kind of compressed version of it. Yeah, I, Great compressed version. And I think there's a lot of value in, in what you just suggested there. And it's the strategy that Warren Buffett uses. So I, I think there's, there's some merit to your, uh, your approach. Now, you happened to say something in the middle there, which was you don't see yourself as an entrepreneur or a business owner. You didn't really see, see yourself going down and creating your own business. However, uh, yeah. I do know that in the last six months or so that you started helping uh, as a side hustle other yeah. people to invest and you've grown that in six months to $100,000. Now, yes. that to me sounds very entrepreneurial. That sounds that doesn't sound like something who isn't an entrepreneur. That sounds like something who is an entrepreneur. So I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit about uh, what you've been doing there. Clearly, you've taken your knowledge and your skill that you used for yourself and you're helping other people to do the same. Got it. Yeah. So I, I think you, you said something so right, right? I'm like a walking irony <laughs> it's an oxymoron <laughs> yeah, like, I, I i really don't have entrepreneurial blood but you know because what happens is i just love teaching and speaking and i love investing so um just to kind of do a recap so yeah i am teaching an investing course right now with a good friend of mine and so over the last six months uh, combined with the investing block 
which has a membership subscription. And, and that's his, by the way. Uh, that's not what I do. For me, I'm more in the speaking training part. So that's the investing cost. Uh, but total combined has been $100,000. But uh, in revenue, I think the good part is because we don't have any paid traffic. So it's purely organic from Twitter. We have a strong following on Twitter. Uh, so that gives us like a profit margin of like 80, 90 percent ish. Yeah, but I think to kind of answer the question regarding entrepreneurial blood. So I don't do it because I want to, so, you know, entrepreneurs, I'm sure most entrepreneurs, you think of that purpose, that opportunity there, there's a, there's a gap in the market and you go fill it because you want to, I realized because my own boss, Kelvin, which is a good mentor of mine, I, I, I've spoken at length with him and I realized what drives most entrepreneurs, including him, is just this need to build something. The entrepreneurs, you guys just have the need to build. For me, I don't have the, the, the itch to scratch to build something. For me, it's just, I just love to teach and speak and just inspire others. It's just that bug within me that uh, Maslow's hierarchy, higher pyramid calling, what have you. So uh, that's why I do that. So I guess the money just comes about as a byproduct. Uh, but I think to kind of um, go a bit deeper onto the side hustle, the reason that we were able to generate that amount of uh, revenue in such a short time was because I think to kind of in full disclosure, it was kind of like a, an overnight success, but it took quite some time in the making that um, me and my good friend who ran the investing course, uh, what happens is we were so passionate about investing. We started sharing our ideas, our investing thoughts and strategies online on Twitter over the last nine months to a year. This was for free. So we just did share on Twitter, just out of passion, just the love to share and like a, be like a lighthouse to do like meet other like-minded individuals by sharing our investing ideas on Twitter. And Twitter's the platform because uh, Facebook's just only my friend. So Twitter has the algorithm to, to spread it to a more bigger domain, right? And then from there, uh, we were very lucky in the sense where I guess because maybe most investors on Twitter, they are Western. I guess we're the only two random Asian dudes <laughs> and, and looking very nerdy and stuff. And of course, I think the, the content has to be valuable and have to have some substance. Uh, we were very lucky to build like a following of 30 and thirty to 40,000 followers each uh, on Twitter over the last nine, 10 months of just writing content daily. So I think, yeah, you can see it's back to my uh, craftsman mentality of if I want to do something, I want to build an audience, I do it daily. I build a habit every day. And so I was able to build that audience. And so the essence was we built an audience who actually liked our investing strategies. They subscribed to our investing mentality and they like us as people. So there's a little bit of that uh, experts business kind of model indirectly happening there, even though it was never my intention to do that. It was just for, as an outlet for me to just share. And with that audience, then it gives you the optionality to monetize, right? Because I think for a lot of business owners, a lot of side hustlers, a lot of people who start side businesses, they have the greatest products, the greatest cost, the greatest videos, but they're the world's best kept secret because you don't have an audience. Even if you have great content, nobody knows you exist and nobody wants to buy from you because they don't know that you exist. So for me, I, it was the reverse. I had an audience of 30, 40 K hungry raving fans and all, all we needed was just to turn on the tab and like, hey, you know what? Let's just do an investing course, uh, create the, the content, the slides, and then do like a two-week webinar style for this course. We sold it at like uh, 500 US dollars, which is about 700-ish Singapore dollars. Uh, did two cohorts of about 100 students so far. And yeah, so the rest is history. So it was having the audience there and then just turning on the tab. So that's why you see, I, I termed it specifically as a side hustle, not really as a business, because I didn't approach this with the business mentality in mind, but more with the, let's build an audience. And then the audience gives me the optionality to be able to kind of monetize it if I want to. Yeah. I love that. And so even though you didn't necessarily set out with that as your intention, you come from a place of service, you built an audience. Uh, and of course, then you have, you can offer them a product or service. Now, one of the things you spoke about when you were talking about buying new businesses, it was uh, it was investing in an asset. But it sounds like your craftsman mentality of serving people has actually created you an asset in terms of an audience. So the audience can also become uh, very valuable and, and generate you some good dividends and good returns. Now, Max, you, you share so much value and so much wisdom here. Uh, I have the question, which is around the quality of the questions we ask ourselves impact the yeah. quality of our lives. We may have already heard you give the answer. Like you've already given us two very great questions from uh, from that already. But I wonder what is one question you've asked that had the biggest positive impact on your life? Yeah, so 
Um, because you know this is the theme of your podcast, right? So <laughs> this was what kept me awake for the last few days, trying to think what's that one question? Because you know, internally we always ask these subconscious questions, but we never really crystallized it out. So you know, in our mind, it we kind of get it, but if I were to say it, like, well, that sounds so stupid when I say it. So I was trying to crystallize it, and I think to answer that question, it's actually there were two questions. So I'm gonna be a bit greedy here and just share two because that's the truth, right? There were two, and um, okay, to be fair, it's only one, but there was a transition. So, so far, you saw me share a lot about habits, craftsman mentality because of the Sushi Master documentary I watched. So the question, like, I think to kind of crystallize it, that I was asking myself over the last decade or more was really the question of, like, am I using my time the most wisely such that I'm actually honing and improving my craft from where I was the week or the month before? So I can share very upfront. It's going to sound a little bit selfish, but... In full disclosure, I want to be transparent as well. I was very, very selfish with the way I used my time when I was younger uh, because of the craftsman mentality. Because truth is, we only got 24 hours in a day. So I have only that limited amount of time to improve myself, whether it's by reading uh, books, watching courses, improving my speaking skills and my investing knowledge. So uh, whenever I had a new opportunity, a new kind of quote-unquote distraction come up, I will always ask myself, Will me spending this time there? So that was, that was a question I asked. Will me spending this time meeting this person, doing this coffee networking session, help to improve myself? And uh, in terms of whatever skill I wanted to develop. So for me, it was investing and speaking. And I was extremely ruthless. I would say no a lot. I was like the classic no man, you know, like the yes man kind of thing. I was the opposite. I was the classic no man. Everything I would say, no, 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 because I just wanted a lot of. Uh, private time to go hone my skills. So I was very selfish and very guarded with my time. But I would say that did a very good thing for me because it gave me so much time to go build the assets in terms of the skills that I needed. So, so that was the question that I started asking myself, that I asked myself almost every day when I was younger. And then only in the more recent years after I started crossing uh, seven figures, uh, I do like a six month uh, reflection on my own every six months. It's just kind of reflect my life. So I do it by writing down. And I recall there was this one day, it was at about 29, 30 years old. So it's been about a few months after I crossed my seven figure mark. I was just doing the reflection. I was like, okay, Max, like I just had this aha moment. Like, isn't it time we started to kind of say yes a bit more and live a little? Because my whole life, I've always been the kind that says no to everyone. That um, So I kind of have, I would say a younger version of me where I didn't spend a lot of time with friends and family. It was a sacrifice to kind of build the things that I wanted to build. But I started asking myself, isn't it time we started saying yes a lot more? And at that point in time, I came across this book that had a profound impact on my life as well. It's called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. So uh, the author's name is called Kenneth Stanley. So as the book title speaks for itself, I'm not going to destroy the book by giving out all the secrets for you guys. Go read it yourself. It's an amazing book, which I cannot stop telling people about everywhere I go today. Uh, the essence of the book was a lot of the great things that happen in our life, whether it's achievements, personally, financially, spiritually, whatever, they happen more so because of serendipity instead of just pure brute force and planning. So of course, there is diligence, there's hard work, there's skill involved, there's no credit taken away from that whatsoever. But if you actually think back to a lot of things in our life, the, the hard work and diligence we applied, it was also because we kind of crossed paths with that certain someone, that something that gave us that platform to then kind of apply that skill to us. So for me, I would say I would count myself lucky if not for meeting my mentors, Kevin and Patricia, and being able to have that platform to go apply my speaking skills. No amount of craftsmanship or watching stand-up comedy or honing my skills will allow me to get to where I am today because I didn't have the platform that they provided. And me meeting them was just purely serendipity, purely by chance. And then me reading that article, that book by Naval Ravikant was also purely by chance. It's just pure randomness. And so the essence of the book is, if life happens so much because of serendipity, then you should be a little bit more, it's an irony, right? Uh, a little bit more systematic <laughs> about trying to make serendipity happen. Therein lies the irony, <laughs> right? By being yeah. a, uh, increasing the surface area of luck. So funny enough, Today, I'm like a little bit on the opposite side of the spectrum where I say yes a lot more, which is why this podcast is now happening because I can tell you in the past, this would never have happened. I would just have said no. <laughs> this uh, 8 a.m., which is in Singapore time right now, I'd rather sleep and have the energy needed to go 
do better things yeah. in my day. But uh, when I look back, I'm like, okay, cool. Like Max, isn't it time we say yes a lot more to have serendipity open more doors for us? And believe it or not, that's the reason I went on Twitter. That's the reason I started tweeting about my ideas. That's the reason I started meeting more people randomly. And guess what? It's because of Twitter, me sharing my ideas randomly with no outcome whatsoever in mind, me saying yes to a lot more podcast interviews. That was how I met my co-trainer and partner, which is doing the investment calls with me right now, because I said yes, and I just went out there to open the doors out there. And so I think today, the question I ask myself a lot more is, will this activity and opportunity in front of me that I, I want to do, will it increase the surface area of luck and serendipity for me? If the answer is yes, I'll go do it. So I'm still very cautious about just saying yes to random things, like just random coffee sessions with people who like may be in a completely random industry that I have probably no interest in. And maybe I would feel may not have that much value to add vice versa for me as well. I probably can't add much value. So I still don't really like like random coffee conversations where it's just, hey, how are you doing? Chat about the weather, shoot the breeze, and then talk about the dog and the hamster. Like not my thing. But um, I, I do am a lot more selective in terms of will this increase the surface? Is it a, a bigger generator of luck? And if the answer is yes, I'll go do it. So I start doing a lot more podcasts. I start writing a lot more online. I think in the last one year, I think that you probably noticed this, even if we've, we've been friends on Facebook for the last like few years, but if you actually noticed closely, I've only been a lot more open with sharing my ideas uh, online in the last one year, purely because of that book. So before that, I was very craftsman, heads down, very Asian as well. So very cliche. I want to keep <laughs> to myself. I'm a bit fearful of the limelight. I'm a bit embarrassed. I don't want to talk too much about myself. I've got the Asian genes within me. Uh, and so, yeah, so those are the two questions. I hope I kind of uh, didn't exceed the limit because I know it's one question, but yeah, those are two questions. Yeah. Uh, when, when the questions are so, are so good, you can exceed the limit. So I think really, really great question. <laughs> and yeah. I, I love how they're kind of uh, slightly opposite to each other. So really uh, the important thing in the first question then is, Am I really, and I don't know if I got your wording exactly right, but am I really using my time wisely to be focused yeah. on improving my craft? And that really links back yeah. into the craft, my mentality and the habit there. I think that's, that really comes through very strongly. And of course, the second part, we, if we go too extreme with that, you say we, we close down all opportunity, you know, we're just focused in so much. So we need to allow ourselves to open up and let in some of this serendipity or luck. So the question and again, I won't get your words exactly, but is am I giving myself the opportunity to allow that in? Am I putting myself in a position to allow some of that luck or that serendipity to come in? I love both of those. And I think they're both that we can use. The bit that I, I think is something that I recognize a lot with the entrepreneurs I work with is you had that firm ability in the beginning to say no. If it wasn't going to allow you to get to the, uh, you know, to focus on your process, to focus on your craft, yeah. the answer is no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. It reminds me yeah. of um, another book I, I read. Uh, quite a while ago now, uh, when I first started on this topic of this show, and it was by an Olympic gold medalist um, who was a, a rowing a rowing gold medalist. And his question, it was the name of the book, is like, will it make my boat go faster? Right? And he had the same mentality as you. If he's not going to make my boat go faster, I'm not doing it. The answer is no. Do you want me to come to the pub for a drink? I'm not going to make my boat go faster. Right? And so he could very clearly uh, articulate yeah. that. So I love, I love both questions there. So is it going to help me improve my craft? And is yeah. there some opportunity here for this to bring me more luck or more serendipity? So I love both of those questions. Uh, Max, you've been an absolute uh, legend. There's so much wisdom and, and value uh, in this, this podcast. Um, I can't thank you enough. Is there, is there any uh, final messages or things you'd want to share with the audience? And uh, if the audience wants to follow up with you and get connected with you, where do they best go and find you? Yeah, I think the final message would be, I think, um, the saying no or saying yes, but really depends on what phase you are at life. So I think the final message is, uh, because whoever is listening to this, you're, you will know your own phase of life better than me or your phase of your career. So if you're still at a stage where you're building assets, um, I think that is quite a bit of wisdom and being a bit of ruthless, uh, being a bit more ruthless and asking that question, which uh, Kevin just mentioned so nicely, will this make my boat go faster? And there's really no shame in saying no, because quite frankly, the unfortunate thing is, all of us only have 24 hours per day. That, that's the asset that you have that's never going to, unlike money, you can keep printing, you can keep earning, like it's just 24 hours. So the ability to build the skill set or that skill asset only comes if you're able to say no to the other things that gives you time to then go build those assets. But 
once those assets are there and you feel that you're at a certain stage of life where maybe you want to be a little bit more, a bit more open to opportunity because you already have a certain asset base, then maybe saying yes more by thinking of luck generation is a lot more wise. So I would say that really depends on what phase you are and I hope that is helpful. Uh, in terms of where to find me, so yeah, you can find me on Twitter or on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, my handle on Twitter and Instagram is called Hey Maxco. So uh, it's H-E-Y. Uh, M-A-X, and then my surname, which is K-O-H, right? So, hey, Max Co on Twitter or on IG. Um, you can follow me there. And of course, uh, on Facebook, you can just search me out, Max Co. I believe it will probably be the first one that pops up, <laughs> um, I guess, due to the number of uh, posts I make on Facebook. Um, yeah, so pretty much that's where to find me. Yeah. And wherever you're listening, just check the show notes. We will have that link there so you can click straight through. Max, I'm so thankful for your time. And uh, I'm off to go and get some sushi now after that course. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for having me. It's so cool. Thank you.